Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening to all of you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening for our leadership dinner. I'm going to interview our two very special guests here in just a second. I wanted to say, though, that uh, I am truly honored and privileged to be on the advisory board for ALEC. I have been involved with ALEC now for going on 12 years as both a uh, public sector member when I was in the Missouri legislature and uh, now on the private side. I joined back in 2007, mainly because Senator Ed, Ed Emery told me I had to. So, And, uh, and this, I think the senator is still here tonight. I had great mentors and role models, and they told me about this organization I never heard of. And uh, as they say, the rest is history. It has been a, a wonderful ride, and it is really a, a pleasure and honor to be with you all here tonight and continuing to be a participant in ALEC in the, the private sector. <laughs> Creative disruption, boy, do we see that more than ever before in our nation across our country in a very positive way. And the two people that I'm going to introduce exemplify that in so many ways, in very different ways, but in, 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 very, uh, in, in very similar ways as well. You know, I, another way to describe that is, is they, are, they are happy warriors, you know? I think those of us who who stand for freedom and liberty and federalism and free markets, we often get tagged as something very opposite of that. But our vision is one of positivity, of looking forward, of, of, of seeing that the, the best days are, are truly ahead of us. So, without further ado, let me introduce our next two speakers who are going to entertain us with some, uh, some, some very enlightening news and stories of their own. Governor. Doug Ducey is the 23rd governor of the state of Arizona. Elected in 2014 and re-elected in 2018, Governor Ducey has applied his experience from a successful career in business to bring much needed change to Arizona government. From day one, the Ducey administration made it a priority to make Arizona a land of opportunity for all. When the governor took office, the state had a one billion dollar budget deficit. And even for lawmakers, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and still struggled to recover from the Great Recession that had afflicted our land. Today, as we sit here, the state budget is balanced with a one billion dollar surplus and one billion dollars in its rainy day fund. Obviously, business is thriving. Arizona continues to make national headlines for groundbreaking reforms. I know all of the other uh, colleagues of Governor Ducey that continue to have a very spirited uh, debate and competition, a friendly competition between all of them, including the state's uh, new law making Arizona the first state in the nation to provide universal recognition of occupational licensing, something the governor will talk about us with more tonight. <laughs> This is so important. It, it's so important for individual freedom. Why? Because it puts the individual in the driver's seat of their profession, of their lives, of their family, of their opportunities, and that's how it should be. I, uh, I actually know Governor Ducey uh, rather well. I've, done, I've had the pleasure and honor of having several, uh, doing several events with him in the great state of Arizona. I've seen him in, uh, in action, and he is definitely a happy warrior for freedom. Additionally, another person who expertly knows how to package occupational licensing in a persuasive way, more than most, is the digital media manager at R Street, Shoshana Weissman. Shoshana. <laughs> Shoshana has always had a great relationship with Governor Ducey because they both care so much about this very important topic of occupational licensing. And uh, you all have these little cards, I think, at your tables, and something, there was a line in Shoshana's bio here that caught my attention. It really exemplifies a lot of what we continue to do here at ALEC. Uh, describing how she recently managed digital communications for Opportunity Lives, a group that highlighted positive stories and positive policy solutions, something we've been talking about here all week long. One last thing before I have him come up to the stage. 
A lot of times, uh, you know, we're not supposed to do this at public events, but I want you to get out your cell phones for a second. And I want you to follow these two great leaders, these two happy warriors for freedom, <laughs> at Doug Ducey, at Doug Ducey on Twitter, and at, this is my favorite, at Senator Shoshana as well. Between the two of them, these two thought leaders have over 120,000 Twitter followers. Let's get him a few dozen more this evening. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Governor Doug Ducey and Shoshana Weissman from our street to our stage. mic's on. I didn't know how that worked. But <laughs> no, thanks so much for having me. Um, so funny story, a couple of years ago, my friend was at Alec, and I saw a picture of her with Clint Bullock, who's sitting right there, and I was so jealous. I'm like, this isn't fair. Why does she get to meet him and I don't? So <laughs> eventually, <laughs> eventually, I got to meet Clint, but it's such an honor to be here to speak in front of Clint and in front of so many people I admire so much. Um, it's kind of surreal because I look up to all of you and the work you all do, and ALEC has been such a good organization for just bringing, all, bringing everyone together. I mean, there's so many people I know from all sides of politics and policy in this room. And it's an even bigger pleasure to talk with my favorite governor and favorite elected official, who I nerd at probably more than I would mm -hmm. like. But, um, but it's, it's really a great opportunity. So I just wanted to thank you all for listening to me. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. So I'm here to talk about my favorite thing, occupational licensing reform. So for those of you who might be new to the issue, you know, you might want your doctor to have a license, but what about your florist or your hair braider or your manicurist? Um, those are the kind of things we fight. And when you have a license in one state, it doesn't transfer. Well, that is until now. Mm -hmm. um, but it was funny because when Governor Ducey introduced the bill to help licenses transfer, I was amazed he was able to get it through and he's had so much success with it. So I'm really excited to, for you all to hear how he did it. But first, um, when I first met Ducey, I remember thinking, wow, this guy is doing all these cool regulatory reforms and all this licensing reform and appointing like IJ's co-founder to the Arizona Supreme Court. Like, or were you an, un uh, uh, an unenumerated rights nerd or you know, a legal nerd? How did, you, how did you do all that stuff? What made you do it? Well, but before I begin, I just want to say thank you to Alec for having me here tonight. I know you're celebrating your 46th anniversary. I am very grateful for the work that, that you do. Uh, I think when you talk about how do I do some of these things, uh, I know we've got our Senate President here, Karen Fan, and I was with Speaker Rusty Bowers yesterday. <laughs> you know, Shoshana, I come from the private sector, and Cold Stone Creamery was my company. I always say you get <laughs> still get spontaneous applause to this day. You get a lot of undeserved popularity when you sell ice cream for a living. It all goes away when you balance your first budget. And uh, you can't get good ideas through the legislature if you don't have a good legislature. And I'm always amazed, and many of our legislators are here tonight, I'm always amazed when I see other governors in public that are beating up on their legislature. And I think, well, no wonder you're not getting much done. Uh, <laughs> it, it's really this idea of, of good ideas. I think we can all agree that this is, this is not a Republican or a Democratic idea. This is just a good, common sense uh, idea. The first law that I was able to pass as governor was the American Civics Act. And that's so that every high school kid in Arizona would not receive their diploma until they passed the same test that a new American had to pass when they were naturalized. <laughs> so my philosophy is rooted very much in that, that constitutionalism that, that I want to see, that I believe has allowed us to govern uh, and create the greatest country in the history of the world. But then it also comes from that free market perspective that allowed me to, to build Cold Stone. And I was able to see, as we crossed state lines, what states were tough 
on entrepreneurs and scaling a business and what states embraced it. And I wanted to, Arizona, the place where Cold Stone was founded, I wanted it to remain a, a beacon of freedom and opportunity. So that's a big accomplishment, especially, you know, everyone who's worked on licensing reform knows that you're up against a lot. You're up against the boards, um, entrenched interests, and all this. How were you able to get something so big through? Well, it's step by step, and what I would say to everyone out there that wants to get this done in their state, as proud as I am of Arizona being the first state to pass this, just like we are with the American Civics Act, I'm probably more proud that 31 other states now have adopted the Civics Act, and I hope that 50 states take what we have done and match it next year. I believe the best way to get this done is to begin with military spouses. Military spouses move typically every 18 months to two years. We all embrace and revere our military and we want to do things to help them. So to allow a military spouse to apply their occupational license in your state is, is typically something that's much easier to get done through a legislature. It's something that we had done before we did this. And then we had a real champion for uh, this idea in our state legislature. Of course, we had great leadership in both chambers, and we were able to do this in a way that was, was bipartisan, uh, and you came out for the celebration and saw how we were, were uh, able to celebrate this. Um, so it's something that we're proud of, and I think in a room like this, everyone understands the idea of universal recognition of an occupational license is just common sense. You, do not lose your skills because you pack up a U-Haul truck in Chicago, Illinois, and move to Phoenix, Arizona. And now it's the law of the land. Now, it was, I think, maybe three months after, after that went through, um, the Pennsylvania governor copied it, which is great. That's what we want. But it's amazing how, you know, you can see how, how you guys leading the way was able to already make the change there. I know other states have already shown interest. What's the response been like? Like, have people told you stories about how it's helped them? Well, there's been two, two responses. One has been from other governors. Uh, President Trump actually invited us to the White House. Governor Wolf was there from Pennsylvania. Governor Ige was there from Hawaii. Governor Reynolds from, from Iowa, uh, and they were all eager to know more about it and reapply it. And I noticed that as well at the uh, National Governors Association. So it does tell me this idea, this what we think is a, a rebirth and a reset of economic freedom has a, a lot of runway and, and running room. And then the other thing is what I hear from citizens. Some of the letters that we've posted on our website would really uh, turn your stomach as to what these bureaucrats and bullies inside state government, inside these boards and commissions have done to people that have received their education, that have a license. I'm very proud that Arizona's been the fastest growing state in the nation, Maricopa County, the fastest growing county in the country, Phoenix, the fastest growing city. I think that's a leading indicator. People vote with their feet. But I imagine many of them were shocked by how they were treated by some of these insiders inside these boards and commissions. So we've been able to overcome that when people have come from somewhere else. We also did uh, some things like put a moratorium on any new regulations. We've been able to reinstitute that every five years. And we fired all government-funded lobbyists off of every board and commission in Arizona. That was another one of my favorites. <laughs> Very politically popular. Firing lobbyist is a big winner. I remember when um, one of your staffers had told me about that, and I had to check. I'm like, wait, government hires lobbyists, to lo and I like had to go through it with him a couple of times because I'm like, no, no, this can't be a thing. Like, they just talk to each other, but apparently not. So that was one of my other favorites. But just as you're saying with the boards and and the the frustrations that you've dealt with with them, and even the cosmetology board uh, cracking down on a guy cutting hair for the homeless. How dare he? Um, you know, it's you've dealt with a lot from them. So how? How, how, how have they dealt with it? How have the boards been with this new law? Well, the, the boards, uh, I, I know exactly what they're thinking when I walk into a room. It's that we'll outlive you. 
We were here before you got here, and we'll be here after you leave. That's why I say that the, the government-funded lobbyists that were on those boards was something we could do through executive order. Uh, there's other things we're doing to, to attack this problem, to push back on the special interest and, and the cronies. Uh, the best thing that we've been able to do, in addition to what I've al already listed, is this, this idea of really blowing a big hole in the regulatory super state by this recognition. And if other states do it, it really levels the playing field. And this is, this is for the small guy. This is for the newcomer. This is for the, the guy that wants to go out and work for a living, but somebody's telling them they can't do it. They've got to go back to school. They've got to take on more debt. And you pointed out the cosmetology board. There's these uh, shops that have popped up all over uh, Arizona, I imagine all over the country, these, these blow dry bars where you can go in and get your, I, I don't go in there, but uh, <laughs> my wife does. And uh, many of you ladies look wonderful tonight. But they were actually having somebody, this is, a, this is a place of business where there are no scissors involved, only blow dryers. And you had to get 1,400 hours of training, 40 weeks, more than an EMT to do this. You had to go deep into debt, of course all the opportunity cost of not working for 40 weeks. So we've been able to, to leapfrog a lot of that. There's still a lot more work to do here. It's just really focusing on it and, and getting the wins step by step and, and incrementally and then trying to do the best you can, not only through statute, but rule and elimination of regulation. We focus, you know, everyone wants to talk about what laws they're going to pass. These are two laws. That, that I'm proud of, but we've also talked about what we've wiped off the books. I, uh, in my second state of the state, quoted Barry Goldwater, who is an Arizonan, and said he ran for office not to, to pass laws, but to eliminate laws. And we've been able to eliminate 1,098 regulations out of our 11,000 written regulations. And it's not only the elimination of those over 1,000 regs, it's a $73 million tax cut equivalent without touching the general fund $1. I love that. Can we like just do that everywhere? Mm -hmm. And again, some of you may know I've had a proposal to clone Doug Ducey so we can just have more of this throughout the country. Um, unfortunately, science has yet to catch up. But, <laughs> but um, one, one other thing, ALEC has a bunch of different pieces of model legislation um, that mirror efforts throughout the country and Goldwater and IJ. Um, one of the proposals is basically just a regular review to make sure that the least restrictive means is always used when, when something is regulated and to make sure that that's constantly reviewed. I know that sometimes sunrises and sunsets kind of just pass and don't do anything, but how, how can you implement this and, and in a way where, um, you know, uh, sorry, uh, taking it in, in Arizona, if you had a law like this, how can you make it work? Like, how do you make sure that, that they're held accountable? Yes, well, first I want to say, I, I love that ALEC presents model legislation. We're very proud that what we've been able to do now will become part of that model legislation. And I do think this idea of, of review, or I am a big fan of sunsets, the things that I have moved to the ballot have all had a sunset around them, because I believe in that. I know that with the best of intentions, there are going to be unintended consequences to what you pass. And if something is a good idea, then it's, uh, it, it's beholden to those that follow you to, to make the case again. But if it's a bad idea, there's nothing better than, a, the, than a, a, a regular review or a sunset so that you can stop it. Because if you don't, you know, I think it was Reagan who said the uh, best proof of uh, eternal life on, on Earth is a government program. You've got to have these things <laughs> in place. That's great. Um, so I know you have a few years in office left, thankfully, but um, what do you want to do during the rest of the time? Are there other regulatory reforms you're kind of thinking through? Well, sure. I mean, right now I feel like in, in Arizona, we've really done the hard work. Uh, if you think about where we were four years ago and the difficult decisions we had to make, and it can be done. I mean, we actually had a government in my second year that was smaller financially than it was in my first year. We tightened the belt. We made difficult decisions. We have fewer employees working in state government today than we did in 2014, yet we have 300,000 new jobs in the private sector. So this can be done if you apply the philosophy that everybody believes in this room.
And so when you say, what, what more do you want to do? It's like we want to take advantage of the momentum that we have. In my third state of the state, I was able to stand at the podium and say I would be remiss if I, di if I didn't thank my partner in growing Arizona's economy, and that's been California Governor Jerry Brown. <laughs> Jerry was incredible. I have high hopes for Gavin Newsom. So we want to continue to do that. What I want to do is make sure that the state is left in a, a much better place than I found it. Uh, our relationship with Mexico is better than it's ever been. We, of course, are working on, on border security, but we are also working on the trade relationship. And uh, Clint Bullock will always be evidence of my good decision-making <laughs> ability. He was my first appointment to the Supreme Court. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I did not so silently nerd out at my desk when I saw his appointment, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing because you know that's what one does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what can we do, what can people in this room do to, to do more of the good work that you're doing in your state and other states? Well, I, I think uh, one thing that is great about conferences like this is not only the, the camaraderie and the uh, idea sharing, but it's also the promotion of, of those good ideas. Um, governors are pretty collegial. You're never going to see uh, two governors split screen on cable TV yelling at each other. That's something Congress does. Uh, governors are chief executives. They set an agenda. We all pretty much have the same problems we need to solve, and we have a very healthy competition amongst one another. Now, I've never had any problem uh, finding a good idea elsewhere. My training coming out of school was at Procter & Gamble. We called it search and reapply. It was that if you could find a good idea elsewhere, you were to bring it back to headquarters and apply it legally and with attribution. I used many of those same ideas to build Cold Stone Creamery. I think that, that best practices for states really exist right here at ALEC and to get not only legislatures but governors to do this and then to apply these good ideas that uh, it's only rather recent in our political life that I believe the economy has become this wedge issue. I mean, it's amazing to me that Bill Clinton ran for president and the, the, the line that they used to organize and focus their campaign is, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> And all of a sudden, the economy has become this idea that they want to paint one side as the haves and the other side is only for the have-nots, where we know that the truth is in a thriving economy that allows for rungs on the ladder for service workers and newcomers to climb and, and do better. So um, to me, that is really, if we can keep those pillars of freedom and opportunity happening within our, all, our 50 states. We're going to have to navigate through what's happening in Washington, D.C., till we have a Congress that sees it the same way and actually wants to solve some of the country's real issues, like a humanitarian and security issue on, on the border, as well as the USMCA, which is something that will be very good for our economy. And my concern right now is that it's seen as a, uh, a election year issue and would be seen as a win for one side. And I think that would be uh, very dangerous. And uh, hopefully uh, Congress uh, feels more highly about our country than they do about the presidential election. Well, even in that, you can the, the way you think through things is just very focused on stability and very focused on good governing. Um, so how how do you think through that? Like when um, and how do you find new ideas? I mean, obviously, Alec is one way, but um, but it seems like you pull ideas from everywhere, and it seems like when you think, it's not a partisan thing. So it's not like you're going to like the GOP website and pulling ideas just from there, but that you're really trying to get the best of everything and to communicate it in a way that's just natural and human. So how do you go about that? How do you tail your messaging and get your ideas? Well, there's, there's a, a, a lot of places, I, I think, for people that have the philosophy that, that we share uh, c can find these ideas. I mean, uh, National Review, uh, National uh, uh, Affairs, uh, th those are, are, are two periodicals that I think have been uh, really helpful. Yuval Levin has, has been an incredible person in bringing good, good thinkers together. I mean, the Wall Street Journal editorial page has, has an incredible amount of good ideas. And then I'm someone who's very uh, uh, focused on, on what's the vision and mission, and then l let's set some goals. I mean, if, if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. 
So what are the metrics? Uh, this is why I do like to brag on the growth in Arizona because it doesn't happen by accident. Uh, when you point to the budget numbers and where we are, where we are in terms of tax competitiveness, how many regulations do we have and how many have we eliminated, I think if you stay focused on that, you can build a, a consensus around it and actually make headway. And it's just not about rhetoric, it's about the evidence and then people actually see the results and the outcomes that you have in economic growth and prosperity and growth growth and paychecks, all of those things. I mean, uh, the, the fundamentals of, of college football, which the season starts here soon, is blocking and tackling. And the fundamentals of, of governing is, are taxing and spending. And you've got to be responsible for each side of the equation. So a lot of your thinking goes into just being a governor. And it's not something you often hear from Congress as much or from Senate. You don't think of them as, you know, here's how I am a senator. So, but you also seem to really enjoy it. So what's your favorite part of governing? Well, I, I, I do enjoy th this role. I think being, uh, well, uh, I'd never been to Washington, D.C. till I was 46 years old. I went on this YPO inside Washington trip. And I was really fascinated by the way public policy worked. And I'd never met uh, Senator John Kyle, and uh, I asked for a meeting with him. Uh, he gave me an incredible amount of time, and I told him I was actually thinking of, of getting involved. And his first question to me was, uh, do you have an executive personality or a legislative personality? And I knew the answer immediately. I said executive. And he said, then don't even consider running for Congress or running for the legislature. You should run for governor. Um, and it has been a position that I, I've really enjoyed. Now, with that said, I will tell you I value incredibly people that are good legislators, moving technical policy through committee and chamber and building consensus. And our majorities are very tight in Arizona, within one in our House and, and, and two in our Senate. So th that takes skilled legislators. And I, I do think they're a skilled set. I've certainly learned much more about how to move good policy forward. Some of it's been ideas out of our office, but some of it's been the relationship we have with our legislature, where they can come to us with good ideas and prioritize. I will tell you, in that first year when we had to balance the budget with the billion dollar deficit, I was able to meet with all of our legislators legislators and they weren't happy meetings. Um, none of the news was good news and I said to, to one who was rather upset with the budget that we were going to have to pass and the cuts we were going to have to make, I said, you know how whenever you say something about the governor out in public, it gets back to me? And he said, well, of course, that's, you know, what the yellow sheet is for and these other uh, 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 writings that are out there. And I said, well, this is what I want you to do on this budget. I want you to blame me. Okay, this budget, I said I was gonna balance the budget. I'm asking to balance the budget. You don't have to be accountable for this. Let me be accountable for it. And our economy's gonna be better this time next year, and we'll be able to make different decisions. Or, if it's not, if our economy is worse, we'll be happy we made these tough decisions today. I lived through several downturns as a, as a business leader, and I knew every time once we came out of the downturn, I wished that I had acted faster and dug it deeper. And I wasn't at uh, age 50 at the time, gonna take the 30 years of experience that I had in the private sector and, and waste it. So I wanted to act immediately on that. But, but saying there isn't much we can do on your agenda in this first year, but I know these three to five things are important to you. And as we come into next year, if we're out of this hole, we'll be able to do some of this. And we were really able to do that. And I think our citizens, I was talking with a lot of our elected leaders here today, you know, we're out and about, we're in public, we're in the grocery stores, and it's such a toxic political environment. But I know many of us here, people say thank you. They know that Arizona is on the rise. They know that people are moving to our state from other places, and they sense it. You know, 70% of the adults in Arizona were born somewhere else. So to me, again, that's a, that's a real indicator. People move to where they think they are going to have a better life and a better opportunity, and it's something that I never want to squander. Well, what, uh, one thing that obviously shows through is that you just don't have much of a partisan mind, that it's about good ideas and good solutions, and, um, and that's something that I wish that more elected officials did, and it's something that I think is really big here, and it's something I appreciate. 
um, especially because there's no need for it. Um, and one other nonpartisan issue that I'm curious about how you're approaching, um, unfortunately, it's only Texas. Texas is the only state in America that has a three-toed sloth. So what are you doing to bring three-toed sloths to Arizona? I, I, I committed when I ran that I was going to be governor of all the people. <laughs> And uh, I will say I think the three-toed sloth would have more success if they moved a little faster in our economy. And, and that's not passing judgment on you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm just about out of time. But let's give the governor a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.